Breaking the cycle to step forward. Authentic conversations from lived experience and a professional perspective in overcoming abuse with Chris Tuck and Beverly Ann. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Breaking the Cycle to Step Forward podcast with me, Chris Tuck, the lovely Beverly Ann. Hello. And our special guest today is Claire Waxman, OBE, and she is the Victims Commissioner for London. So welcome, Claire. Thank you. Nice to be here. Lovely to have you on. So we're going to talk about everything today with Claire to do with the Victims Bill, the Victims Law, the Victims Code of Conduct. We're going to talk to Claire about her own personal experiences and the landscape of what she's working on and in at the moment and maybe what can victim and survivors get involved with if Claire needs our help um so we'll talk about that at the end so Claire can you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself please your childhood your you know growing up as a young person and um your earlier career that would be great okay um so um yeah i mean i had a happy childhood growing up i had um i have two much older siblings so i was very much the baby of the family and was very much babied still to this day i'm approaching 50 and i'm still treated like a <laughs> baby um but uh, yeah, very, very fortunate to have a really lovely family, two elder siblings that always look out for me and always there for me. So um, I was always a very um, competitive, driven young person, um, always interested in people, always very empathetic, always wanting to look out for people. Um, I you know, did a number of different things uh, in my early career. I was working in marketing and TV. Uh, it wasn't really for me. So then I set up a therapy center, um, pulling together therapists from all different backgrounds, uh, complementary medicine. So looking at nutritionists and osteopaths and chiropractors and, and really working with people on you know, what they're doing needs assessments, actually, interestingly, with people and working with them on, on what they needed in order to feel well and healthy. So um, that was very much my business for, for many, many years. Um, wow. Didn't know that about you. So I've learned something already. I thought I'd shared that with you before. <laughs> you might have. have done i think i have i think you forgot i do remember menopausal brains for girls uh, well, we got that as a minute so yes so i, I emphasize with that so um yeah so that was very much my my career and my and my focus but you know very shortly after opening my own clinic and business um and i was 27 at the time when i opened my my business um the stalking started Oh, wow. So, so that was sort of a year into having my own business, um, the, yeah, the, the stalking uh, started and, and it has still continued to this day. So that's over 20 years, giving away my age. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. We'll come back to that in a moment, but I just want to make sure that Beverly asks a question on your earlier bit, if that's where she's going. That is, but now I want to ask another question as well. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Take your turn. So I um I obviously I've met you quickly, Claire, and I've been looking at your your history and I saw some of your business, what you've set up, and I was particularly interested because I am actually a, a practitioner myself and mind body medicine is something that I'm very passionate about, you know, particularly after trauma, etc. So this is where it's really quite interesting to see where you were and where you are now mm. now I know that there's only so much we can ask you about what's going on at the moment um and are you able to share why what what you've got to be careful about about my own case so there yes are, obviously I can talk about about my case um I don't tend to talk too much about it anymore just because I've done a lot over the last 20 years pulling out what I needed to pull out to really shine a light on um, what is stalking, uh, what is the impact of stalking. But I think what is where we haven't quite shifted over the years is really understanding, and I think Beverly, this will really resonate with you, is the 
the trauma. This is a very traumatic crime and it has a huge impact, a psychological harm and impact on a victim. And I don't think society or the criminal justice system really fully understands that. And that sort of early career of mine, which was a sort of holistic, you know, all about holistic uh, medicine and therapies, I was always interested in trauma. And so it's really the two worlds are sort of collided now because I do bring that into my work as Victims Commissioner for London. It's why it's one of the, my proudest bits of work is on the London Rape Review that I did back in 2019. Uh, when we published that and the recommendations, one was around understanding the impact of trauma on memory and recall yes. in relation to, to rape and sexual uh, offences, survivors and victims, and why there might be inconsistencies and why in their accounts and why they might respond in a certain way. And I've really tried to bring in sort of the past life of all the work I did and now and all the understanding I have of stalking to try and make the criminal justice agencies more aware of trauma to give a trauma informed response but understand what does trauma look like mm -hmm. in a survivor and a victim what is the impact of trauma um and so my case the sort of the, the, the stalking over 20 years has has a huge impact on me personally um from a trauma perspective uh, from a psychological perspective and I don't think it's ever been fully recognized and understood um, through the criminal justice system and how that criminal justice system is utilized by a, a perpetrator like a stalker yes. and you continue contact as well and the harm that that causes and we are still too far we're quite far away from from really having that good understanding in the criminal justice system on that. Mm. I completely agree with what you've just said there, Claire. Um, but it's just really weird how you came from a holistic background and then moved into trauma because of the stalking that you've undergone, endured. And then Bev and I, we've endured the abuse first and then come through to the holistic journey afterwards and dealing with the trauma. And I really agree with you about the criminal justice system and the institutions within that criminal justice system, the police, social care, CPS, do not understand trauma and its impact. Even doing some training with the Met last month, I turned around and said, um, when you're getting your VRI, your, your victim's um, interview, uh, used to be called the ABE, Achieving Best Evidence, um, the victim survivor is going to remember so much, then they're going to go away. And the way the brain processes that, they're then going to remember more detail. So then they're probably going to come back to you with that detail. And they just stood there and sat there and just looked at me and went, oh, really? And I'm like, really? Well, that, that's really you disappointing. You don't know this basic stuff. That, that I would say is really disappointing and maybe we'll take that outside of this because we will yeah I'm working with the Met I've been working with the Met very closely on this since the London Rape Review was first yes. published um looking at the impact of trauma and um is that I don't know where that came from not my so it's uh, looking at the impact of trauma um and especially around as you may be aware the Met and other police forces across the mm -hmm. country have been signed up to the Operation Soteria work, Soteria, yeah. which is to um, change the way that the police and the CPS investigate and prosecute rape cases yeah. and to be much more aware of the impact of trauma and understanding, you know, what that means and how a victim will look. Um, so that is disappointing because they should have done that work and should be much further along than what you just said. And that's why I think it's really interesting that when you do get the opportunity as a victim survivor trainer, someone with lived experience and goes back into the institution and see what has changed and what hasn't, it's very interesting then to bring that back out and um, where should they be? Where are they and how are they going to move forwards? Um, yeah, but their point of view was more that the um once they get the abe the vri it's then when it goes up to the cps and then when an, a second or third statement's taken it's then the cps that says 
why wasn't this detail remembered first time round? Why why is it now they're not a credible witness? And that was really shocking to me. So that's the police telling you, and I would I would push back on that, and I would challenge and question okay. that. Okay. What I know very well, and I've seen it, is that the CPS have developed training modules around impact of trauma, and have actually taken on that. Rep- recommendation of mine from that first London rape review really embedded it and are trying to really challenge themselves and to recognize inconsistencies. So I would say what I've been seeing with CPS is some really positive work to to try and address that so that they can recognize inconsistencies does not mean that that victim is not credible. It just means impact of trauma. So I would, you know, there's often a game between police and CPS, and we see that, and I see that all the time in my work. I think it's really important to challenge agencies. Okay, I will do that, as you know. I know know you will. (laughs) (laughs) Beverly. And and I'd just like to add a caveat as well to anybody listening or watching this video as well, because the wonderful thing about having these discussions is not to pull people apart, it's to Mm -hmm. raise awareness is to have these difficult conversations because it's one thing to learn about something but it's very different when you're actually putting it into the practice and as you say Claire challenge challenge what the agencies have said because we very much sometimes we hear a decision's being made and think oh well that's the final decision well actually as we're learning now in lots of different areas with lots of different institutions that's not the case you know challenge it it's okay to challenge it which is an important message for anybody who's listening and is finding that at the moment yeah I think just picking up on that Beverly I think it's important to understand what so if you are talking about challenging uh, police or the CPS about a decision I think the victims or survivors need a couple of things with that firstly they really need to understand what their rights and entitlements are under the victims code of practice and we know and again that's been a huge piece of my work as Victims Commissioner for London, really shining a light on the fact that agencies do not comply with that Victims Code of Practice, do not deliver rights and entitlements to victims as they should. So um, there is work underway with the government's Victims and Prisoners Bill, and I put prisoners because I'm many of us are not happy that it was extended to include mm. prisoners. So that Victims Bill um, is meant to drive better compliance of the code so the agencies to comply better. And what that bill is, what is currently got in it, is a duty well on, on those agencies to promote the code to victims. So that's helpful. So victims should be able to find out their rights and entitlements. When can they... Um, you know, challenge a decision through a victim's right to review with the police or the CPS. That's really important that they know that. But what's equally important is that not only that they know that, that they have the support to be able mm-hmm. to do that. Because most victims, even if they're given that information, will find that incredibly tough to do that process. They're already going through, as you know, so much. And then to have to then have that energy um, to, to, to start challenging as well and not necessarily knowing how to go about it. That's why advocates are so important in the criminal justice system and why Huge. I continually pushed for what I've been calling a victim care hub over the years. But what I mean is to have a criminal justice navigator really alongside that victim. So that victim doesn't have to be burdened with, okay, that's my right now. How do I access it? What do I need to do to go through that process? There's somebody there um who who does that on that victim's behalf and helps them through that very complex process so advocates are really important alongside information for victims to challenge and good wraparound support as well because you need good support and this is where we share our lived experience and i'm i don't mind sharing following um participation in the truth project i was involved in being interviewed by the police video statement etc but one of my challenges and i'm always honest about this one of my challenges is being vulnerable and asking for support Mm -hmm. so when i look back now when i went to make that statement i actually went on my own i was on my own making the statement and i left on my own and i wouldn't want anybody else to do that so if anybody's thinking about doing that listen to what claire's saying about having support and an advocate well (laughs) 
you can listen but the thing is i i can't guarantee you're going to access it because that's the bit that i'm trying to push is there are, there aren't these advocates and there's certainly so for for rape and sexual violence you could have an isva an independent sexual violence advisor uh and for domestic abuse you'd have an idva but we don't have enough of those for every victim and they're also not being uh sort of accepted properly in all parts of the journey so mm. an isva might be on behalf of that rape survivor trying to get that information trying to help them through for example the victim right to review process but they not, might not be getting the information shared with them by the police or, or the CPS. So again, the victim's bill offers an opportunity to try and tackle some of that. There's work within the bill to um, to work on ISVA and IDVA uh, stat guidance around what, what their role is. Um, but we'll need more than that. We need sustainable funding to ensure that every victim has an access to has access to good advocates through the criminal justice system and we're not there yet. And I can share and I shared my journey with you Claire since 2018 is that there is high attrition rates when people journey through the criminal justice system because of the lack of communication the lack of support so having this person to help them navigate all their way through is it's just gold really i think that's how we improve attrition rates and that's how we improve outcomes even if it's not a judicial outcome i.e imprisonment for the perpetrator it's the fact that the victim and survivor going through the pathway is not re-triggered and re-traumatized as they are being now yeah absolutely and and you know i through this role uh you know met uh, countless victims and yeah. survivors of all crime types um not just in london but across the country as well and i will always ask them you know from your experience what would you like to see change mm -hmm. and they always describe this need for this advocate or navigate navigator type role to take them end to end through mm -hmm. that justice system um so it's something i have continually pushed i've been you know talking to government about it is there a way of using the victims bill to to move us towards that um there's a currently there's a joint inspection happening uh with the police the cps and probation and again saying to those inspectorates why don't we you know recommend something that is really different like this, that will really help victims through the criminal justice system. So, you know, continually trying to push it, um, maybe one day it'll land. Yeah, because not only have you got that layer of trauma that people are dealing with, and we was talking about the, the stalking and that continual trauma that you're living with day in, day out. It's not pro post-traumatic, it's in the moment, you're still yeah. living it because yeah. you're still dealing with it. So you've got all of that going on. And then when you have to try and fight through the victim's right to review and that whole protocol, that whole process, and you're literally having to ask, do a subject access request for that information and that information, you can get lost in it all and bogged down by it all. I know I've been there, I've done it. Um, to have someone helping you all the way through that, as I said, is just gold. Can we just ask you, move on a little bit, how did you become Victims Commissioner for London and why? And does that feed into your Quebec visit and the Victim Summit that you did? I don't know. I'm just asking the question. Um, so I can answer the first one. What do you mean? Does it feed into Quebec visit? What? Um, so all of the work that you've done so far, yeah. how, did, how did you become Victims Commissioner? Let's yeah. start with that and then oh, I'll, I'll come to the Quebec one separately. Um, yeah. so, so how did I become Victims Commissioner? Right, so uh, as I explained, I sort of was running this business of mine, this therapy centre, and then the stalking started a year after um, I'd set the, the business up. Um, and really, I was then pulled into... Um, you know, it was about a decade of continually going through the criminal justice system, reporting to the police, going to court, etc., and having to to live very much as a stalking victim. There was no quality of life at all. It was just that was my life. Um, and I think I was sort of ten years into my case, and I just thought, like this, <laughs> this is relentless, and this can't continue. Um, so I was a bit slow at working out, you know, how to use my voice, how to create a platform. So I started to speak out, started to speak to the media started to go and request meetings um you know with my local mp with the police with the cps etc um and then started to become as many victim survivors do as you know a campaigner um 
worked on trying to bring in stalking legislation so worked with a number of other brilliant um, stalking campaigners uh, and we worked together and we did we were successful we brought in the stalking law in in 2012. Um, so that was sort of my campaigning moving into that on the back of bringing in the legislation I decided to set up an organization called Voice for Victims um, mm. and um, just wanted to hear from other victims because as much as we had changed the law on stalking and I was doing a lot around raising awareness and training of stalking and focusing a lot on my own lived experience, I was very aware of something that wasn't being spoken about was the awful experience of put the stalking aside of being a victim in the criminal justice system and being re-victimized by every single agency I came into contact with. And I strongly believed at the time, this was sort of 2012, 2013, that the code, that victim's code of practice was toothless you know, wasn't enforceable, no one knew about it, your rights aren't being delivered. So I thought it wasn't worth the paper it's written on. I wanted to see some strength to that and some enforceability. And I came up with the idea of victims need a victim's law. I wanted victims to have their own law where they had legally enforceable rights to justice and support. So through Voice for Victims setting this up, I spearheaded the campaign for a victim's law. And so um, that kind of took me down a very different path. So you know meeting mps and uh you know meeting ministers and talking to police and cps and meeting many victims across the country uh, doing research and campaigning and that's what voice for victims did and we you know i got it you know quite successful after a few years by 2015 the victims law ended up in the manifesto as a manifesto commitment so we were making headway um i was also looking at other areas of interest so i was very much aware through my work around the use of legal proceedings by stalkers and abusers to continue contact with their victims that wasn't being recognized it was very much a tool used in my case and my case is, is very well known for this use of of the civil courts to continue stalking um, because I took the CPS to High Court for breaching my human rights because they failed to um, prosecute my uh, stalker for bringing vexatious claims in the civil courts to me. They didn't see it as a breach of restraining order, so I, I challenged that. Um, and that gave me an, you know, another campaign idea, which I called the Abuse of Process campaign, which was looking at how uh, abusers were using civil courts and family courts to continue unwanted contact with their victims and to can you know and to cause them harm and trauma through these legal proceedings where it looked like they had a human right to be able to access but they were exploiting that right in order to create harm to the other person so they were my two big campaigns that i did from voice for victims um and then uh i worked with keir starmer when he just became an mp um because he had just left CPS, he was, uh, you know, the DPP of CPS, and he left that and then became an MP. But in between leaving CPS and becoming an MP, he was looking into the idea of a victim's law. Uh, and I thought it was quite ironic, actually, because when I found out he was doing this, remember, I had just sued the CPS, I, I was um, a little bit angry to begin with, because I thought, well, why is he looking at victim's law when he breached my human rights? So um, he'll always tell the story of he was in Camden doing a speech on the victim's law. And I think I was heckling him a bit from the audience. <laughs> and at the end, I went over to him and introduced myself and was ever so angry. And he was brilliant because he said, well, fine, we'll work together on it. And we did exactly that. So I ended That's up brilliant. working with Keir Starmer on drafting really the first victims bill in, in 2015 when he became an MP. Um, and then at the, so by 2016, Sadiq mm -hmm. Khan had become mayor and in his manifesto commitment, he had made a commitment to appoint the first victims commissioner for London. So when I heard of that, I just thought, well, that's mine. I can't be anyone else. I just, I just said that. I could see it. You know, sometimes in life you visualise. Yeah, you do. Yeah. I've been doing it through Voice for Victims. Yes. And, and, and honestly believe that was my calling. I had to get this job. Now, remember, I'd run my own business for years. I hadn't yeah. been employed by anyone. And I had to go. I was 42 at the time. I had to go for a job interview. I haven't been for a job interview since my early 20s. It was really nerve wracking yeah. um, just to tell people, you know, and I was always seen as, although I had voice for victims, you're still often seen as the kind of the token victim in the room, yeah. and 
you know, oh, yeah. yes, we need to engage with the victim, just wheel this one in, wheel them back out. And you don't... A good case study. Yeah, you don't <laughs> often get treated as a professional. Yes. And I remember at the time people telling me, no, he'll want an ex-police officer, he'll want an mm. ex-judge, he'll want ex CPA. you know, not going to want you. And so a lot of people were dissuading me from going for it. Um, and I went for it. And, um, you know, thanks to Sadiq, he saw that I was the right person and appointed me. Um, and it was uh, the best thing he's done. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, but it, it is. It yeah, is no, the no, best no, thing he's ever done. I always joke with him. I go, it's the best decision you've made. But, <laughs> but it was really, I have to say, groundbreaking of him. Yeah. Yeah. Because... You know, it was giving me a lot of, putting a lot of trust in me and a lot of faith in me to do this role. And and he did that. And I'm forever grateful that he gave me that platform. But you have done a brilliant job and you have got a, um, a history of doing a, a, a good job at challenging the institutions and making the journey right for people coming up behind you. So the job is yours, should be yours, in my opinion. So it's and been... It's been a challenging job. I mean, it's, yeah. it comes with a lot of challenges. When I first took it, you know, first person in the role, there wasn't really thing, anything set up. So, yeah. you know, it's taken a long time to kind of get the the office set up and to get the role accepted. Um, so, yeah, that's that's been quite challenging. But I would say on the whole, it's been very much well received. I have, you know, brilliant relationships with all the criminal justice partners I work with. They're very accepting of the challenge um, and that, you know, that had the way I have to work. They have a, you know, we have a lot of mutual respect um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's been, it's, it's, that's very positive. So I've seen, look, we are not where we need to be for victims, yeah. but I have to say, I've seen a lot of growth from individual agencies. Of course, there's still mistakes. You know, we hear about the Mets repeatedly in the media, but there is a shift towards wanting to do better wanting to understand um the victim survivor journey and and trying to 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 make it a much more seamless trauma-informed journey uh, and i would say all the agencies are trying to work with me on that well that's good to hear and for me personally it's good to know that there is someone in the job like yourself that truly truly gets it so that they obviously respect you and trust you in working with you and collaborating with you. So the fact that we're having this conversation and I'm hearing this, it does make me feel more trusting in the criminal justice service if I wasn't before, because I feel, because of my experiences, um, that it still needs a lot of work. But just hearing from what you've just said, it makes me feel better about what you've shared with us. It does need a lot of work. We're still yeah. a lot of off. You know, if a victim is going into that criminal justice system now, it is tough. It doesn't work well. There are lots of failings and flaws that need addressing. Yeah. The thing that has changed, so that so we haven't got to the reform that I have visualised for many years no. there yet. Yeah. But we are on a journey, and I would say mm -hmm. that the hardest bit was getting people to agree with me on things and to take them on the journey and we are on that journey mm. together so that is a positive yeah there yet with having made the fundamental changes that we need to make so that victims so a victim can report to the police you know i, I want to be confident that they get the right response a good response as you said earlier on chris which is absolutely right you know the justice outcome will be what it will be mm -hmm. you don't have much control over that but what you can control for that victim is to make yeah. sure that every agency that comes into contact with that victim gives them a good service treats them with dignity and respect understands trauma make sure there's good support communication information for them along the journey yeah to, to make it less traumatic than it needs to be but at the moment yeah it actually exacerbates and compounds victims trauma and that's what we need to move away from we do indeed okay so moving on now obviously you've um, run quite a few victim summits in your time in post um and the recent one the victim summit 23 that you, it was a two-day event if I... No, it was a one-day. It felt like a two-day event. Day. It had felt to like... like two days. Yeah, yeah it should have been, but we only had one day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was only in, in attendance. Um, 
it was well, that, that led you inviting um someone from quebec yes in a high position can you share with us who that person was and yeah. why you invited them and what that's led on to for us please? yes so um as you write out i had done two victim summits previously before the pandemic um and they were all great you know the first one was quite early on in, in my appointment so it was a few months in and it was sort of just to really you know launch the role and the work that i was going to do with the victims code and the rate reviews and so that was just you know very helpful actually we talked about trauma a lot at that first one and then the second one was around the victims code which you came to chris and you you spoke to that was the victims code of practice compliance review so talking about the recommendations we talked about if you remember we had uh, i brought someone over from canada then dr laurie haskell talked about the impact of trauma which was a phenomenal session uh which obviously helped with the recommendation in the london rate review so unfortunately because of the pandemic we couldn't do any more and so this was the first one post pandemic really to to do um and what i really wanted to get across on this victim summit is obviously the the progress that's been made so far but where do we need to go and to really amplify to those agencies in the room. Remember, we had all our stakeholders in the room. Anyone who was in justice was in that room. Um, was about that victim journey through the justice system. And I think you remember the fragment, you know, we were the first people to devise these maps and we've pulled together, no one else has ever done it. The awful fragmented complex justice journey a victim has to navigate. Um, I can't tell you how many people have rung up and said, can we use them? Can we use them? We're gonna use them for our training. Because it just, I think it just visualized, my goodness, look what we ask of a victim to come forward and report, and then look what we subject them to the whole way through the process. And what I wanted to do was really land that idea of the victim care or the navigator role that I've been trying to talk about with everyone. This is why it's needed. We obviously centered the day around survivors' testimonies, as I always do, bringing out mm -hmm. those lived experiences throughout the day to show the different parts of the justice system and just yeah. how complex and fragmented they are but i always like to look at where is the good practice across you know we have if we haven't got it here who's doing it well somewhere else and we did we started to look for many months uh, we spoke to colleagues in new york we tried to get hold of people in sweden you know we were looking all over to see yeah. is anyone doing it well and we came across um the justice minister of quebec uh, simon jolie barrett and he's a lovely man and we spoke to him and he was doing very innovative work and um, he had something called CAVAC which is like this victim care hub where that CAVAC worker will go through the criminal justice system with their victims uh, he also had a uh, specialist rape course that he just set up which is something I've been calling for for a number of years in light mm -hmm. of the the delays to justice and just how long rape victims have to stay in the justice process and want a specialist rape court. So I thought he would be a wonderful person to come over. He was very excited and he came over to present the good work that Quebec are doing. And so he came to the Victim Summit and as a result, he said, uh, come to Quebec. This is a very interesting story. It's a bit of a funny one. He said to me in the day, I've got a conference in May, come along and hear all about the specialist rape court. And I said, sort of, I'd really like to obviously I've got to get it signed off with work you know it's it's you know got to check that you can do things like that because we can't just spend money on going somewhere yeah. it's really going to bring us value for money and it's going yeah. to be useful for us to do and, and help with victims so um he sent the invitation it took some time anyway I did go to the conference I spoke at the conference and I was there for five days meeting all the different people within the justice agencies and different support services so huge learning great practice to bring back um but when i was there i found out someone from the ministry of justice said oh we've got to thank you and i said why well, they said he came back from london he said we're doing a conference in may <laughs> apparently they didn't know about it so there we go so it was a lot of work in the end but but so uh they weren't so happy but they were happy in the end because obviously they get to showcase some really great work that they are that they are doing uh, and they are you know they've got this Kavak model which is very yeah. similar to what I want to bring in which means the minute anyone reports to the police um we have here so when you report to the police we have the victim you have to tell so the police need to tell the victim about support services but the victim needs to give consent that they're happy for their details to be shared with the support service um there it's automatically shared 
so that that Kavak worker will get in touch with the victim, explain the process, tell them what's going to happen, demystify it for them and take them through yeah. the process. But what's really great and what I saw firsthand was the Kavak is embedded within the police, it's embedded within their prosecutor's office and within the courts and it's the same agency the whole way through and yeah. so they build what they keep calling it is they build a team around the victim so yes you have your police and you have your cps but you've got your covac worker who coordinates yeah. it all who makes sure that everything happens as it should the whole way through the justice process so that victim it just sounds bliss yeah. So that victim doesn't have to battle and battle yeah. and try and make their way through it. So um, some really good practice with that. Um, and some other really interesting things, which I think will be interesting to your listeners. They've got a fantastic compensation scheme there. And Ooh. what's really interesting, and again, I'm presenting this to government at the moment. Um, as we know, uh, the compensation scheme, there's been consultation. <laughs> 2020 and obviously there's the ICSA recommendations as yeah. well so uh and it's back out for consultation again as you as you mm -hmm. know, came out only yesterday or the day before so this week yep. so um we keep consulting uh, yeah, but we actually, don't need to consult anymore we need to do uh, i did i did flag that to the minister i met him actually it was only this week i met him on monday it feels like a long week oh. so we could say it then you know i don't think we need to consult anymore i just no. think we need to do <laughs> But uh, they said they have to consult, so that's the situation we're in at the moment. But I did talk to them about the compensation scheme in Canada, and I think in Quebec, sorry. What is really interesting, so there's no time limit for uh, CSA, rape or domestic abuse. No time limit. So you can apply Good. at any time. Yeah. Other crimes, it's three years. Right. So, and that's set. So there's no time limit. You also come in and it's needs-based. So okay. it's quite quick. So they'll do a kind of needs assessment and they'll make sure that you get into the right support and help quite quickly. So you wow. don't have to go through all those forms that we currently have to do with Seeker and it takes time for a decision. It's because it's not always a financial compensation. It's, it's a mm -hmm. compensation. What do you need? What was your yeah. loss? What do you need? And sometimes it's around childcare needs. Sometimes it's around health needs. Um, there might be a payout. There's a loss of earnings, but it's very much needs focused. Yeah. And I think that is a brilliant compensation scheme. I know, you know, then you get away from the, the issues that we often hear that, you know, especially for rape victims, they're cross-examined in court around what you only, you know, you think is valid. Yeah. And, and, and it's not. It's just people need to, you know, there's been an impact of this crime and you want to have um, something as a result to help you through it. Why should you have to pay out all this money because you've lost something? But Claire, just going back to seeker criminal injuries compensation, then maximum payout is 22,000, literal compensation, uh, loss of earnings is separate, yeah. but 22,000, I've probably spent that in my lifetime in private professional support in one way or another. So I never even got the 22,000 to start with. I have been compensated for open and honest, transparent conversation, um, but it's like, when you're only in it for the compensation in quote marks these people don't realize how much it costs just to get the support that you need just yeah. to be able to function and if you're not functioning how much more money do you need but you just don't have access to that money to get the support that you need so it blows my brain that um that that argument that they throw at you you know so it's just not right just on a on an aside and i can sorry baby i can see your hand up but on an aside so i've been a victim of stalking 20 years i've had yeah. well now in court cases now six seven forgotten anyway too many and yeah. um, and as you will know i'm a very um driven person i don't mm -hmm. take no for an answer i'm quite relentless um I've never accessed compensation. I tried it once or twice. I gave up because it was just too difficult. The process, even that pro. So if that pro, what I'm trying to say, if that process put me off, mm -hmm. I can't yeah. see people doing it because I I can stick with a lot. I just couldn't even see the benefit of it. Um, but interestingly, for stalking victims, it just doesn't recognise the psychological injury and impact at all. Wow. So wow. that's the problem yeah. we have with it. And yeah, I had to pay. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know when it was very bad the stalking my daughter had to be taken out of nursery uh, yeah so i had to have her at home i had to had to pay for the childcare. yeah i had to pay for cctv 
uh, I had to pay for security at one point. I, yeah. I mean, I've spent a fortune being a victim. Yeah. Never have I been paid back for that. And no one it, ever asks you about that, do they? Sorry, Bev, I'll let you come in now. Sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, you were actually brought something up, Claire, that I was actually going to share as well. So um, I'm actually um, a care leaver as well. So I've been in and out of care. Um, lived on my own from 16, as Chris did as well. So when I first accessed any support for my um, abuse, sexual abuse, it wasn't until I had two children. So I was like late 20s, early 30s. And it was my counsellor at that time, at my very beginning of my recovery journey and my healing journey, that opened my eyes to compensation. And you can imagine the application putting it all in and it came back at that time rejected and I, and it is rejected that doesn't matter how it's written yeah that's how it's rejected and their words at that time was because my abuser lived under the same roof as me at yeah. some time yeah. he was my dad yeah um and I still have the forms here and it's a conversation I've had with Chris sometimes about how I I will resubmit it I will res resubmit it but they're there and it's on my to-do list but it's it's not just the resubmission it's everything else that goes with it and I think for anybody listening who's thinking of doing it you are human and please you know if you can take anything from this podcast you know I will be reviewing <laughs> um, my rights etc and taking on what you're saying Claire but yes it's it's more than just the money. I think it's more about being heard and acknowledged yeah. when when we when we make that application for compensation. <clears throat> we know we may not get judicial acknowledgement by the per, for the perpetrator, but for ourselves, it's not about how much we get. It's really about being acknowledged ourselves, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think when you've gone through the criminal justice system uh and you don't get the justice that you feel you need and then you go to criminal injuries compensation and you do get an outcome there and that outcome is basically we believe you there is some kind of resolution there a little bit but not everybody goes through either of those systems and they never get to hear any kind of acknowledgement of what they've gone through so claire what are your future plans what would you like to see change i think we've heard quite a lot already but let's just <laughs> revisit what you would like to see change and how can people listening to this podcast help you with any of this work if indeed they can i don't know if they can okay there's a lot let me try and there's a lot um so number one we have the victims and prisoners bill making its way through parliament so um this is an opportunity to try and improve the way agencies deliver rights and entitlements to victims um and to give victims better status in the criminal justice system the bill in its current form is weak and ineffective it, okay. If it came into law tomorrow, it really wouldn't make the difference it needs to make. Okay. So, um, in light of the fact there is no National Victims Commissioner still. Yeah. Um, why? Uh, why? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't it's, know. Okay. it's for government to, to uh, appoint. Um, yeah, I don't know. And we keep pushing them and um, to say we need someone really quickly here yeah. um, because otherwise it's just I've got a very small office and we are London but we are we've stepped into the national role to do you know because this to help yeah for me so so we are trying to work with everyone we can extracting evidence issues whatever it is to try and help cross party or MPs to understand why the bill needs to be strengthened yeah so I suppose it's just a few things it's if you've had um, and that you're aware of if you if you you know if you don't know anything about the victims code look at the victims code of practice number one if you've been through the criminal justice system did you get your rights entitlements 
you know, if you didn't, where was it breached? Making it known, you know, where those breaches were um, is all really good evidence to show, you know, that the code doesn't work. Um, we we'll, anything that we are trying to push for. So it's about strengthening the code. We want to see enforceability. Um, we're looking along victims' rights to privacy. So we're very aware, and it's a big piece of my work on, especially for rape victims and for CSA victims, that you're often asked for your mobile phone yeah. data or very personal material like counselling, therapy records. Mm -hmm. And there's a big campaign organization run by uh, End Violence Against Women and Girls, Rape Crisis and Centre for Women's Justice, which very much was a recommendation in my rape review. And this, these incredible organizations have been campaigning to um, really put some judicial oversight into the requests of these therapy notes. Government haven't accepted that. They've put in something into the bill, which is around something called an, uh, an extraction code to help the police only request things that are material that's strictly necessary Specific, yeah but it's not the police that make the decisions it's cps mm -hmm. directing CPS. the police and actually it's the judiciary as well so you it needs a whole systems change it can't just sit with the police this is not you know i will be criticized the police enough but this doesn't sit with the police the fault isn't really only at the police this is a whole criminal justice response to to these to the sensitive material so again it's you know we want to see judicial oversight um it's if you've got experience of that it's sharing that making us aware getting these stories out if you can and you feel able to shining a light on where the failing was for you and potentially what needs to change in the bill to help improve that for others that's really important and more than happy if people have you know, stories they want to share and they think it'd be really useful to amplify different areas of the bill we're trying to improve, you know, get in touch. It's as simple as that. Um, so when you say get in touch, Claire, do you mean um, email your office? Because obviously if you start getting hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, so, 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 so let me guess, because well, I can feel the, the small team probably going, stop talking. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, what I mean is there are different campaign organisations. So it's... Yeah. Be very specific. It's looking at what's in the bill at the moment. So I can tell yeah. you it's around the victim's code, it's around strengthening the victim's code. It's yeah. around victim's rights to privacy. So if you've had your mobile phone requested, it wasn't correct, or therapy notes. Really, it's about the therapy notes. You know, yeah. you requested with counselling records, who requested that, what happened in that process? Are you happy to share that experience? That's really important. You can get in touch with probably one of the organisers, like Evil or yeah. Or one of them that are running the campaign, um, because it's really important to get these lived experiences out and yeah. to shine light on it. Um, an area of interest for me is court awarded compensation. So we've talked about criminal injuries, mm -hmm. but for some cases that go to court, um, victims will be awarded compens for their offenders to pay them compensation. Yeah. Um, my own experience. Um, I was awarded compensation 18 years ago yeah and it's still not been paid out in full oh, so wow. what i'm saying so and and then i started to look at it and when you look at the data from hmcts that money is not being paid uh, it also creates a really awful tie between the offender yeah. and the victim for many years there's yeah. a model in netherlands that i would like where the victim is paid directly by the court and the court yeah money from the offender yeah. so anyone who's got That's any logical though claire though isn't it, it for it to be done that way it is logical from a victim perspective but from a government it's costly so they right. don't okay and but but the issue that we have is that you have hmcts or their sort of department that is supposed to chase for that money from the offender there's no sort of no one's really chasing it because it's not money for the government no Even if it was a parking fine there's no good money for the government it's, yeah. a, it's going to go to a victim so no one's fighting on the behalf of the victim to get yeah. that money back so if anyone's got any stories i do want to hear on that if you were awarded okay. compensation through the courts not criminal injuries your offender no means yeah. tested and had to pay you money if you haven't been paid that money we want to hear okay well that's mm. two clear asks there mm. I could, I mean, yes, there's, there's, there's I a know, lot. There's so much. Yeah. What's the time, Beverly? You're my well, <laughs> well, you're, you're getting that message from my eyes. We are actually a minute away from 
uh, finishing. So okay. I, I can tell you now, there was so much I wanted to say, so much. I'm sure people listening and watching want to say, we will be putting into all the information underneath different various links. As always, you know, if anyone's got anything that they would like to ask um, and you're and you'd rather come through us, we're breaking the cycle to stepforward at gmail.com. And we will be in contact with Claire because obviously, Chris, you know Claire very well. Um, really, it's to say, Claire, and I really don't like saying this, but your last thoughts, because for this moment, our podcast is coming to an end. <laughs> I'm just looking I just wanted to ask one more question, and it was about the you family courts. I know. Well, it's up to you. It's just that we're running over, so it's okay. completely up to you. Two minutes, Claire. What's happening in and around the family courts? What are you involved in? Um, so family courts is a huge area. As I said earlier, I started the abusive process campaign, which looked at the way that family courts are often exploited by abusers. Um, We've had a lot happen over the last few years. Government published its harm panel report in 2020. We've had some progress, not a huge amount of progress to reform the family courts. It is one of the most critical areas for my, for me, for my work. We are inundated with victims and survivors mm -hmm. um, who are in the family courts. So either it's predominantly mothers, and I know yeah. there's an outcry every time I say that, but, but that is it. It's predominantly mothers yeah. who contact me to say that they are either victims of rape or domestic abuse, and their allegations are being minimized and they're receiving counter allegations of parental alienation that yeah. they're only alleging this in order to alienate um, yeah um we also hear from mothers where children have disclosed abuse by the yeah. father to the mother and sadly support services are now telling those mothers not to say anything because yeah. if they say anything the family courts are again positioning it or reframing it is as parental alienation that the mother has coached the child to make these allegations yeah i think the family courts i mean i've said it is a place where i'm seeing state sanctioned abuse and i said it back in 2015 and i don't, haven't changed in fact i think it's worse yeah yeah and um every time i speak out i'm almost penalized for it there's lots of complaints to have me removed from office because of me being very wow. vocal in family courts but it should be a national scandal what's happening yeah. in family courts. I'm very pleased this week that the Domestic Abuse Commissioner published her report around domestic abuse in the family courts. It's a brilliant report. We support and echo all of the recommendations that she's made. So if anyone hasn't seen that, that just was published this week. It's a fantastic report. And we'll be supporting the Domestic Abuse Commissioner uh, to really drive that, that forward. It's an important piece of work for me, very close to my heart, just because the amount of, of victims um, and children yeah, and children. it's the next generation, isn't it? The next we're generation. Trying to, we're trying to prevent this abuse happening, yet we're creating it through the systems that are in place already. You're silencing. So that. the whole thing is we're all on the same page here. We yeah. want to, you know, amplify victims' voices. We yes. want to make sure victims' voices are heard. You know, all of the extra stuff was around children's yeah. voices being minimised, dismissed, and, yeah. and being silenced. Uh, and I... <laughs> And I said it to Ixa at the time when they were doing it, mm -hmm. you've got to look at the family courts because you're, you're yeah. looking at changing mm -hmm. everything. But if you don't change the family courts, there's silencing of children happening there. And again, one, whilst I was working with Ixa, I kept pushing the family courts to be investigated, like they were picking different sections yeah. to look at. So yeah. I did put that forward. And for, as, I think we need to probably have you on again to talk about family courts. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive area. It's a in in another podcast um, because we can really talk about it in depth. So let's leave that there. But if people need to or want to look at the Children's Commissioner's report, domestic, no, domestic violence commissioner, domestic abuse commissioner. Uh, yeah, her report out this week. Then please have a look at that. And if anyone wants to get into uh, touch about that report, would it be her department and not you, or would yeah, it be you both can get. I mean, it's she's. Um... This goes out on social media it's got on twitter it as does, well. yeah so people yes. on twitter well i'm sure you can find it. it'll be on her website but she's yeah. just tweeted it out this week and it's, i think it's a pinned tweet as well so yeah I don't it is yeah yes yeah. it's, it's um okay 
because I think there's a lot more stories, lived experiences to come out, especially as those children grow up to be young the Children are growing up and they'll start yeah, to want to talk use about their voice this. and speak out. Yeah. And, and I think, I think it would be, um, I think it's going to be a, a real... It's be a big scandal. Yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely, 100% big scandal. Well, Claire, I've got those eyes from Beverly, so yeah. I need to shut up and <laughs> thank you very much for being a wonderful guest as ever. And we'd love to have you back on to talk about your work and how things are progressing. And um, keep challenging is what I say, because we want these pathways to be better for all victim and survivors, less triggering, less re-traumatizing, and to get the best outcome for each individual as we can. So that's my last thought. What is your last thought? And Beverly, what is your last thought? Am I going before Beverly? Yes, yes, as the guest. Okay, thank you. Um, my last thought. Um, well, firstly, just to say a huge thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, and for this platform and the podcast that you've set up. And obviously, Chris, we've worked together now, I think, since I came into this role. So we know each other really well. So just a huge thank you to Chris for all the work she's done over the years, especially with ICSA, but also for my work as well, because you've been a huge supporter, the Victims Code review and everything. So just a, a massive thank you. Um, and I suppose just last thoughts, because obviously it is victims and survivors listening. Um, you know, some days will feel very dark, as we all know, and we've all had them as a victim, very dark days, but you are, it's just to remember, you are not alone. And if you can't access good support services, because I know that is challenging and tricky, there are lots of brilliant people who are victim survivors who've turned campaigners or support workers, because peer support is really important in this journey. So we focus a lot on the criminal justice journey, focus a lot on support services and counselling and therapeutic services. But I think peer support is so important as well, because it's other people who've been in your shoes, walked it, gone through it, and can give you really can pick you up when you're having those really bad days so peer support and just to know that not to put pressure on yourself but you have because of the experience you've gone through you can do something positive it's 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 not like, like people say to me and i don't know if they say to you chris and beverly you know oh like how did you do it and it's just amazing it's inspiring it's not you'll find it dig deep mm -hmm. you'll find it you can do it too you can use your voice, you can extract from your experiences and find ways to make sure you're heard uh, and then it can change for other people. If you want to do that, you have the power within you to do that. So just wanted to really, you know, I'm not unique and special, I'm really not. Um, it's just that you find, you know, you can find it and then when, when it gets ignited, that's it, it's on and you're on it. You know, and that's- You I find mean, your fight and passion, don't you? Yeah, there. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. And I, I'm actually going to um, come back to you and say you are unique okay. and you are very right. inspirational. And I knew who you were. And as as we said before we started recording, we've met um, on a, in oh. a on a walk in a winter's night where I was wearing a hat. But to actually get to meet you and hear your passion um, and what you're doing, I for myself, I want to say thank you because it's huge but also on behalf of everybody else who's listening and you're so right peer-to-peer -peer is so important and having a professional with lived experience or an understanding of trauma and the impact is so valuable so thank you so much thank you Chris we have overrun and we are going to say goodbye <laughs> And as I said earlier, if anybody has any questions, please do contact us or, or Claire, and we will put the links underneath. And thank you very much, everybody. And goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.